The defining feature of my generation is a rapidly declining confidence in the current political and economic system to provide us with a decent standard of living or a stable and sustainable future. The collapse in the availability of living wage jobs caused by aggressive free trade policies, increasing mechanization of labor, and decades of attacks on unions have forced millions of working class families to realize that our political leaders are acting not in our interests, but in the interests of an economic elite. Millennials grew up in the shadow of 9-11. I remember the daily news headlines discussing how the U.S. government was lying to the public, torturing people, bombing civilians, and colluding with defense contractors. When Obama was elected in 2008, the first black president in U.S. history promising a new era of hope and change, we were overwhelmed with joy and relief. We truly believed that his administration was going to answer the violence, racism, and corporate cronyism that had dominated the political landscape during our formative years. Imagine then our confusion when Obama's first major act as president was to bail out the Wall Street banks that had just plunged our country into a major recession without even fighting for serious reforms or relief for the millions of families who were losing their homes, their jobs, and their life savings. As the years went on, Instead of a new era of peace and justice, the Obama administration accelerated the drone warfare program, set new records for deportations, and expanded domestic surveillance. We left for college knowing that the cost of a degree required us to take out loans we could not fathom repaying, all while reading news headlines about record-breaking corporate profits and an increasing share of the world's wealth concentrated in the hands of a tiny group of billionaires. This is the experience of my generation. These experiences have driven millions of people to the conclusion that a radically new direction is needed to raise our standards of living. Some of those people have fallen victim to right-wing ideas that rely on the myth of scarcity to justify limiting competition for living wage jobs by returning to traditional gender roles, shutting our borders to immigrants, and imprisoning anyone who steps out of line. But if you look at the cold, hard facts, scarcity and poverty are completely artificial creations of capitalism caused by a pooling of wealth at the top of society. They are not natural limitations of our material world. Right-wing ideas are held by a minority in our country, but not an insignificant one. They pose a real and immediate danger to the safety of marginalized groups and to our ability to bring together the strongest possible coalition of working class and oppressed people to present a united resistance to the agenda of the political and economic elite. It is incumbent upon us to offer a different direction out of the wreckage of capitalism, not backwards to more prejudice and inequality, not in circles with empty promises of hope and change, but forward with concrete policies that lead to a society organized not to maximize profit, but to use the vast wealth and resources of this world to liberate humanity from the unnecessary misery of poverty, war, and exploitation. And that's why Bernie Sanders lit so many millennials' hearts on fire. Here, finally, was someone offering real, concrete proposals that could start pushing back against the brutal economic equality that has shaped our lives. Medicare for all, a nationwide $15 an hour minimum wage, canceling student debt, creating hundreds of thousands of living wage jobs by switching from fossil fuels to renewable energy. But the Democratic Party leadership was quick to declare these unrealistic and utopian and moved decisively to shut out Bernie's insurgent campaign. They tried to sell a former Wall Street lawyer and Walmart board member as the left candidate, which demobilized young and left voters, and left Donald Trump as the only candidate in the race with an anti-establishment message, but the wrong kind. Today, as millions of working class people watch Trump fill his cabinet with billionaires, and propose laws that would disproportionately harm those who are already struggling, Bernie Sanders is again claiming the national spotlight. Right now, he has the highest popularity numbers of any politician in the U.S. by a significant margin. 
His Medicare for All bill has received standing ovations in economically disadvantaged red states like West Virginia. In fact, the mainstream media doesn't like to show these a lot, but there are countless polls out there that show wide support for a whole range of socialist apologies amongst working class people across the political spectrum. There is 73% support among voters for a transition to more renewable energy sources. There is 72% support for paid family leave to be available for all parents and families in the United States. There is 65% support for a path to citizenship for all immigrants regardless of legal status. And there's even there's even 52% support for raising the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour. So the American public is not what is stopping us from moving forward. We want a more socialist world. What is stopping us from enacting socialist policies is the fact that we don't actually have democratic control over how the wealth and resources are distributed in any sector of our economy that's dominated by for-profit corporations, which is all of them. Even if Bernie Sanders were president, he wouldn't be able to enact a good chunk of the policies in his platform without challenging the very foundation of capitalism, the property rights of the corporations that control our economy. If we want to realize the potential that exists today to meet the needs of all people in this country and in the world, we need to bring into democratic public ownership the oil corporations, the drug manufacturers, agribusiness, real estate developers, auto manufacturers, and investment banks, and use their hoarded wealth to build a world organized around meeting human need. If we took the top 500 corporations into democratic public ownership, we could make every job a living wage job and every worker a union member. We could close the gender and racial pay gaps, eradicate unemployment and poverty, end hunger and homelessness, and give every child a world-class education. This is the vision of the future that will defeat Trump and shrink support for his racist, sexist, nationalist ideology. That ideology relies on scarcity to pit us against each other. But we need socialist policies to show that scarcity does not have to exist. Uh, May 1st is a national day of resistance to the Trump administration and an enormous opportunity for us, students, workers, seniors, ordinary people, to show that we have the power to disrupt business as usual and for us to use socialist ideas to energize and orient the anti-Trump movement in a way the Democratic Party cannot. Socialist ideas have the power not only to defeat Trump, but to transform the world. And here in Seattle, we have a huge opportunity to set examples for the rest of the country on how to build a strong anti-Trump movement with a socialist backbone. And the speakers after me will be giving examples of exactly how we can do that in the coming year. I look forward to seeing all of you here at UW and across the city, out in the streets on May 1st. A socialist world is possible.